Charlie, the weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter, all, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed in a fever, one was burned in a mine, one was killed in a brawl, one died in a jail, one fell from a bridge, toiling from children and wife, all all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie, and Edith? The tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one. All, all are sleeping on the hill. One died in shameful childbirth, one of a thwarted love, one at the hands of a brute in a brothel, one of a broken pride in the search for heart's desire, and one after life in faraway London and Paris, 
was brought to her little space by Ella and Kate and Mag. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. In my Spanish cloak, an old slouch hat, and union leather boots, and tight, my faithful dog, and my knotted hickory cane. I slipped about with a hurricane lantern from door to door on the square, as the midnight stars wheeled round, and the bell in the steeple murmured from the blowing of the wind, and the weary steps of old Doc Myers sound like one who walks in sleep in a far off rooster crew. And now, another is watching Spoon River, as others watched before me. And here we lie, Doc Myers and I, where none breaks through and steals, and no eye needs to guard. In life, I was the town drunkard. When I died, the priest found me burial in holy ground, which redounded to my good fortune, for the Protestants bought this lot and buried my body here, near to the grave of the banker Nicholas and his wife Priscilla. Take note, ye prudent and pious souls, of the cross currents in life, which bring honor to the dead lived in shame. Well, they have chiseled upon my stone the words, his life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. <laughs> Those who knew me smile at this empty rhetoric. <laughs> My epitaph should have been, his life was not gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that he made warfare on life, and the witch, he was slain. While I lived, I could not cope with slanderous tongues. But now that I'm dead, I must submit to an epitaph, graven by a fool. Duh. When I first came to Spoon River, I did not know whether what they told me was true or false. They would bring me the epitaph and stand around the shop as I worked and say, he was so kind, he was wonderful, she was the sweetest woman, he was a consistent Christian, <laughs> and I chiseled whatever they wished, all in ignorance of its truth, but later, as I lived among the people here, I knew how near to the life were the epitaphs that were asked for when they died. But still, I chiseled what they paid me to chisel and made myself party to the false chronicles of the stones. Even as the historian does who writes without knowing the truth or because he is influenced to hide it. If I could have lived another year, I could have finished my flying machine and become rich and famous. 
Hence, it is fitting the workman who chiseled a dove for me made it look more like a chicken. <laughs> for what is it all but being hatched and running around the yard to the day of the block? Save that a man has an angel's brain and sees the X from the first. <laughs> You may think, passerby, that fate is a pitfall outside of yourself, around which you may walk by the use of foresight and wisdom. Thus you believe, viewing the lives of other men, as one who in godlike fashion bends over an anthill, uh, seeing how their difficulties could be avoided. But pass on into life. In time, you will see fate approach you in the shape of your own image in the mirror. Or you shall sit alone by your own hearth, and suddenly the chair by you shall hold a guest, and you shall know that guest and read the authentic message of his eyes. To this generation, I would say, memorize some bit of verse of truth or beauty. It may serve a turn in your life. My husband had nothing to do with the fall of the bank. He was only cashier. The wreck was due to the president, Mr. Thomas Rhodes, and his vain, unscrupulous son. And I was left with the children to feed, clothe, and school them. And I did it, and I sent them forth into this world all clean and strong, and all through the wisdom of Pope, the poet. Act well your part, for there all the honor lies. All I said was true. I wrecked my father's bank with my loans to dabble in wheat. But this was true. I was buying wheat for him as well, who couldn't margin the deal in his name because of his church relationship. And while George Reese was serving his term, <laughs> I chased the will o' the wisp of women and the mockery of wine in New York. It's deathly to sicken a wine and women when nothing else is left in life. But suppose your head is gray and, and bowed on a table covered with acrid stubs with cigarettes and empty glasses, and a knock is heard. And you know it's the knock, so long drowned out by popping corks, and the peacock screams a prostitute sing. <laughs> and you look up, and there's your theft, who waited until your head was gray and your heart skipped beats to say to you, the game is ended. I've called for you. Go out on Broadway and be run over. They'll ship you back to Spoon River. As a boy, Theodore, you sat for long hours on the shore of the turbid spoon. With deep-set eye, staring at the door of the crawfish's burrow, waiting for him to appear, pushing ahead first his waving antennae like straws of hay. And soon his body appeared, colored like soapstone and gemmed with eyes of jet. And you wondered in a trance of thought, what he knew and what he desired and why he lived it all. But later your vision watched for men and women 
hiding in burrows of fate amid great cities, looking for the souls of them to come out so that you could see how they lived and for what and why they kept crawling so busily along the sandy way where water fails as the summer wanes. some vibration going there in your heart, and that is you. <laughs> and if the people find you can fiddle, oh, why fiddle you must for all your life. What is it you see, hmm? A harvest of clover? Or a meadow to walk through to the river? <laughs> the wind's in the corn. You rub your hands together for beefs you're after ready for market? Or you hear the rustle of the leaves like the girls went dancing down a little grove. <laughs> oh, Jacuti Potter, a pillar of dust or a whirl in the leaves in mid ruinous drought. But to me, <laughs> they seem more like Redhead Sammy, stepping it off to tour lore. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, how can I tell my 40 acres not to speak and get more with a medley of horns and bassoons and piccolos stirred in my brain by crows, robins, and the creak of a windmill? Only these? And there was never a day in my life that I began to plow. And someone did not stop in the road to take me away to some dance or picnic. Oh, I ended up with 40 acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle <laughs> and a broken laugh and a thousand memories. And not a single regret. Tora Lora Lora Tora Lora Lay Not in that wasted garden where bodies are drawn into grass that feeds no flocks and into evergreens that bear no fruit. There, where along shaded walks vain sighs are heard and vainer dreams are dreamed of close communion with departed souls. But here, under this apple tree I loved and watched and pruned with gnarled hands in the long, long years. Here, under the roots of this northern spy, to move in the chemic change and circle of life into the soil, into the flesh of the tree, and into the living epitaphs of redder apples. My life's blossom might have bloomed on all sides, save for a bitter wind, which stunted my petals on the side of me that you would village could see. From the dust, I lift a voice of protest. My flowering side you never saw. Ye villagers, ye are fools indeed, who do not know the ways of the wind and the unseen forces that govern the processes of life. I am Minerva, the village poetess, hooted at, jeered at by the yahoos on the street. For my heavy body, my cock eye, and my rolling walk, 
and all the horse when Butch Welch captured me after a brutal hunt. He left me to my fate with Dr. Myers, and I sank into death, growing numb from the feet up, like one stepping deeper and deeper into a stream of ice. Will someone go to the village newspapers and gather into a book the verses I wrote? I thirsted so for love. I hungered so for life. You would not believe, would you, that I came from good Welsh stock? That I was purer blooded than the white trash here, and of more direct lineage than the New Englanders and Virginians of Spoon River? You would not believe that I had been to school and read some books. You saw me only as a run-down man with matted hair and beard and ragged clothes. Sometimes a man's life turns into a cancer from being bruised and continually bruised and swells into a purplish mass like growth on stalks of corn. Here was I, a carpenter, mired in a bog of life into which I walked thinking it was a meadow, with a slattern for a wife and poor Minerva, my daughter, who you tormented and drove to death. So I crept, crept like a snail through the days of my life. No more you hear my footsteps in the morning resounding on the hollow sidewalk, going to the grocery store for a little cornmeal and a nickel's worth of bacon. No other man, unless it was Doc Hill, did more for people of this town than I. And all the weak, the halt, the improvident, and those that could not pay flocked to me. I was good-hearted, easy Dr. Myers. I was healthy, happy, in comfortable fortune, blessed with a congenial mate. My children raised, all wedded, doing well in the world. And then one night, Minerva, the poetess, came to me in her trouble, crying. I tried to help her out. She died. They indicted me. The newspapers disgraced me. My wife perished of a broken heart. And pneumonia finished me. He protested all his life long. The newspapers lied about him villainously. That he was not at fault for a nervous fall, but only tried to help her. Poor soul, so sunk in sin, he could not see that even in trying to help her, as he called it, he had broken the law, human and divine. Passers-by, an ancient admonition to you. If your ways would be ways of pleasantness and all your pathways peace, Love God and keep his commandments. After I got religion and steadied down, they gave me a job in the cannon works. Every morning I had to fill the tank in the yard with gasoline that fed the blow fires in the sheds to heat the soldering irons. And I mounted a rickety ladder to do it, carrying buckets full of the stuff. One morning, as I stood pouring, 
The air grew still and seemed to heave, and I shot up as the tank exploded. <laughs> Down I came with both legs broken and my eyes fried crisp as a couple of eggs. For someone had left a blow fire burning and something sucked the flame in the tank. The circuit judge said whoever did it was a fellow servant of mine, so old Rhodes' son didn't have to pay me. And I sat on the witness stand as blind as Jack the Fiddler saying over and over, I did not know him at all. Well, I fiddled all day at the county fair. On the way home, Butch Weldy and Jack McGuire, both roaring full, made me fiddle and fiddle to the song of Susie Skinner. Well, they whipped the horses until they got away. Well, blind as I am, I, I tried to get out of the carriages and went into the ditch and was caught in the wheels and killed. There's a blind man here with the brows as big and white as the snow. And all we fiddlers from the highest to the lowest and writers of music and tellers of tales sit at his feet and hear him while he sings of the fall of Troy. Did you ever find out which of the O'Brien boys it was that snapped the toy pistol against my hand? Huh? There when the flags were red and white and blowing in the breeze and Bucky of Steel was firing off the cannon brought back to Spoon River from Vicksburg by Captain Harris and the lemonade stands were running and the band was playing to have it all spoiled by a piece of a cap shot under the skin of my hand. And the boys are clamoring around me saying, oh, you're going to die a lot, Joe, Charlie, sure. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Which of my chums would have done it? <laughs> oh, many times did Ernest Hyde and I argue about the freedom of the will. My favorite metaphor was Prickett's cow roped out to grass and free, you know, as far as the length of the rope. One day while arguing so, watching the cow pull at the rope to get beyond the circle she'd eaten bare, out came the stake, and tossing up her head, she ran for us. What's that, freedom of the will or what? Said Ernest, running. I fell. I fell just as she gored me to my death. I was the milliner. Talked about, lied about, mother of Dora whose strange disappearance was charged to her rearing. My eye, quick to beauty, saw much besides ribbons and buckles and feathers and leghorn and felt to set off sweet faces and dark hair and gold. One thing I will tell you, hmm, and one I will ask, 
The stealers of husbands wear powder and trinkets and fashionable hats. Wives, wear them yourselves. Hats may make divorces. They also prevent them. Well now, let me ask. If all of the children born here in Spoon River were raised by the county somewhere on a farm, and the fathers and mothers were given their freedom to live and enjoy, change mates if they wished. Do you think Spoon River had been any the worse? Maurice, weep not. I am not under this pine tree. The balmy air of spring whispers through the sweet grass. The stars sparkle. The whipper will calls, but thou grievest, while my soul lies rapturous with the blessed nirvana of eternal light. Go to that good heart who is my husband, who broods upon what he calls our guilty love. Tell him that my love for you, no less than my love for him, wrought out my destiny, that through the flesh I won spirit, and through spirit, peace. There is no marriage in heaven, but there is love. Together in this grave lie Benjamin Pancher, attorney at law, and Nick, his dog, constant companion, solace and friend. Down the gray road, friends, children, men and women, passing one by one out of life, left me till I was alone with Nick for partner, bedfellow, comrade and drink. In the morning of life, I knew aspiration and saw glory. Then she that survived me snared my soul with a snare which bled me to death. Till I, once strong of will, lay broken, indifferent, living with Nick in a room back of a dingy office. Under my jawbone is snuggled the bony nose of Nick. Our story is lost in silence. Go oh, by, mad world! I know he told I snared his soul with a snare which bled him to death. And all the men loved him, and most of the women pitied him. But suppose you are really a lady with delicate tastes and loathe the smell of whiskey and onions. And the rhythm of Wordsworth odes runs in your ear while he goes about morning till night repeating bits of that common thing. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? And then suppose you are a lady well endowed and the only man with whom the law and morality permit you to have the marital relation is the very man that fills you with disgust every time you think of it, while you think of it, every time you see him. That's why I drove him away from home to live with his dog in a dingy room back of his office. She loved me. Oh, how she loved me. I never had a chance to escape from the day she first saw me. But then, I figured after we were married, she might prove her mortality and let me out. Or, she might divorce me. A few die. 
None resign. Then I ran away and I was gone for a year on a lark. But she never complained, no. She said, oh, it would be well that I would return. And I did return. I told her that while taking a row in a boat, I was captured near Van Buren Street by pirates on Lake Michigan. <laughs> and I was kept in chains so I could not write her. <laughs> but she cried and she kissed me and said it was cruel, outrageous, and human. I then concluded that our marriage was a divine dispensation and could not be dissolved except by death. I was right. He ran away and was gone for a year. When he came home, he told the silly story of being kidnapped by pirates on Lake Michigan and kept in chains so he could not write me. Well, I pretended to believe it, though I knew very well what he was doing and that he met the milliner, Mrs. Williams, now and then, when she went into the city to buy goods, as she said. But a promise is a promise. And marriage is marriage. And out of respect for my own character, I refuse to be drawn into a divorce by the scheme of a husband who had merely grown tired of his marital vows and duty. I preached 4,000 sermons. I conducted 40 revivals, and I baptized many converts. Yet no deed of mine shines brighter in the memory of the world, and none is treasured more by me. Look how I saved the blisses from divorce, and kept the children free of that disgrace. To grow up moral men and women, happy themselves, a credit to the village. Reverend Wiley, advised me not to divorce him for the sake of the children. And Judge Summers advised him the same. So we stuck to the end of our path. But two of the children thought he was right, and two of the children thought I was right. And the two that sided with him blamed me, and the two that sided with me blamed him. And they grieved for the one they sided with and were torn with the guilt of judging and tortured in soul because they could not admire equally him and me. Now, every gardener knows that plants grown in cellars and under stones grow twisted and yellow and weak, and no mother would let her baby suck diseased milk from her breast. Yet preachers and judges advise the raising of souls where there is no sunlight, only twilight, no warmth, but only dampness and cold. Preachers and judges! There is something about death like love itself. If with someone with whom you've known passion and the glow of youthful love you also after years of life together feel the sinking of the fire and thus fade away together gradually faintly delicately as it were in each other's arms passing from the familiar room that, that is, is a, a power, power of unison between souls like love itself.
What do you see now? Globes of red, yellow, purple. Just a moment, and now? My father and mother and sisters. Yes, and now? Knights at arms, beautiful women, kind faces. Try this. A field of grain, a city. Excellent, and now? A young woman with angels bending over her. A heavier lens. Many women with bright eyes and open lips. Try this. Just a goblet on a table. Oh, I see. Try this lens. Just an open space. I see nothing in particular. Well, now. Pine trees, a lake, a summer sky. That's better. And now? A book. Read a page for me. I can't. My eyes are carried beyond the page. Try this lens. <sighs> Depths, Depths of, of air. air. Excellent. And now? Oh, light. light. Just, Just light. light. Making, Making everything, everything below it, it a, a toy world. world. Very well. We'll make the glasses accordingly. The beginning is now and will always be. You say you lost your chance. And fate brought you defeat, but that means nothing. You look so sad. You've been listening to those who say you've missed your chance. There's another train. There always is. Maybe the next one is yours. Get up and climb aboard another train. You feel you're down, but there's no such thing. Although you're standing on your own, your own breath is king. The beginning is now. Don't turn. There's another train, there's another
another train. They're all ways is maybe the next one is yours. Get up and climb above. <laughs> Mr. Kessler, you know, was in the Army, and he drew six dollars a month as a pension and stood on the corner talking politics, or sat at home reading Grant's memoirs. And I supported the family by washing, learning the secrets of all the people. From their curtains, counterpanes, shirts, and skirts. For things that are new grow old at length, they're replaced with better, or none at all. People are prospering or falling back. And rents and patches widen the time. No thread or needle can pace decay. And there are stains that baffle so. <laughs> and colors that run in spite of you. Blamed though you are for spoiling a dress. Handkerchiefs, nappery, have their secrets. The laundress life knows all about it. And I, who went to all the funerals held at Spoon River, swear I never saw a dead face without thinking it looked like something washed and ironed. <laughs> How many times during the 20 years I was your leader, friends of Spoon River, did you neglect the convention and caucus? and leave the burden on my hands of guarding and saving the people's cause. Sometimes because you were ill, or your grandmother was ill, or you drank too much and fell asleep, or else you said, he is our leader. All will be well. He fights for us. We have nothing to do but to follow. <laughs> Oh, how you cursed me when I fell, and cursed me, saying I had betrayed you in leaving the caucus room for a moment, when the people's enemies there assembled waited and watched for a chance to destroy the sacred rights of the people. You come and rabble. I left the caucus to go to the urinal. <laughs> <laughs> I was a lawyer, like Harmon Whitney, or Kenzie King, or Garrison Standard. Or I tried the rights of property, a low by lamplight, for 30 years in that poker room in the opera house. <laughs> and I tell you, life is a gambler, head and shoulders above all of us. I know Mayor Alive can close the house. And if you lose, you can squeal as you will. You will not get back your money. He makes the percentage hard to conquer. And he stacks the cards to catch your weakness and not to meet your strength. <laughs> and he gives you 70 years to play. If you cannot win in 70, you cannot win at all. So if you lose, get out of the room. Get out of the room when your time is up. It's mean to sit and fumble the cards and curse your losses, leaden-eyed, whining to try and try. <laughs> Thomas Rhodes Slave, selling shoes and gingham, flour and bacon, overalls, clothing all day long for 14 hours a day for 313 days for more than 20 years. Saying yes sir, yes sir, thank you. A thousand times a day and all for $50 a month. <sighs> Having to live in that stinking room above the rattle trap mercantile. And compelled to go to Sunday school to listen to the Reverend Abner Pete 
104 times a year for more than an hour at a time because Thomas Rhodes ran the church as well as the store and the school. So, as I was tying my necktie that morning, I suddenly saw myself in the glass. My hair all gray. My face like a sodden pie. And I cursed and cursed. You damned old thing. You cowardly dog. You rotten pauper. You road slave. Till Roger Bowman thought I was having a fight with someone and looked through the transom just in time to see me fall on the floor in a heap with a broken vein in my head. They got me into the Sunday school in Spoon River and tried to get me to drop Confucius for Jesus. I could have been no worse off had I tried to get them to drop Jesus for Confucius. For without any warning, as if it were a prank, and sneaking up behind me, Harry Wiley, the minister's son, caved my ribs into my lungs with a blow of his fist. Now I shall never sleep with my ancestors in Peking, and no children shall worship at my grave. <laughs> the white men, they used to play all sorts of jokes on me. They would take big fish off my hook and put little ones on while I was away getting a stringer, making me believe I hadn't seen right the fish I had already caught. When Burr Robin Circus came to town, they got the ringmaster to let a tame leopard into the ring and made me believe I was whipping a wild beast like Samson. When, for an offer of fifty dollar, <laughs> I dragged that beast right out of its cage. Then, one day I walk, in my, I walk in my blacksmith shop, and I shook as I saw two horseshoes walking across the floor as if they alive. <laughs> Walter Simmons had put a magnet underneath a barrel of water. But yet, every one of you, you white men, <laughs> you was fooled by fish and by leopards too, and you didn't know any more than the horseshoes did by what moved you about Spoon River. Ten, hop! The idea danced before us as a flag. The sound of martial music. The thrill of carrying a gun. An advancement in the world on coming home. A glint of glory, wrath for foes. A, a dream, dream of, of duty, duty to, to country, country or, or to God. God. But these things were within us, shining before us. They were not the power behind us, which was the almighty hand of life, like fire in the earth's center building mountains, or the pent-up waters that cut them through. Do you remember the iron band, the blacksmith, Shaq Dye, welded around the oak on Bennett's lawn, from which to swing a hammock that daughter Janet might repose in, reading on summer afternoons? And that the growing tree at last sundered the iron band? But not a cell in all the tree knew aught, save that it thrilled with life nor cared because the hammock fell in the dust with Milton's poems. Company dismissed! I was but just 21 and Henry Phipps, superintendent of Sunday schools, gave a speech in the Bindle Opera House. The honor of the flag must be upheld, he said, be it assailed by a tribe of barbarous Tagalogs or the greatest powers in Europe. And we cheered. We cheered his speech and the flag he waved as he spoke. I went to the war despite
despite my father. Following the flag until it was raised in our camp in a rice field outside Manila. And we cheered. We cheered it, all of us. But there were the flies and the poisonous things and the deadly water and the cruel heat and the sickening putrid food and the smell of the trench just behind the tents where soldiers went to empty themselves. And the whores had followed us full of syphilis and the beastly acts among ourselves all alone and the bullying, hatred and degradation among us the days of loathing and nights of fear. Till the hour of the charge through the sweltering swamp. Following the flag. Till I fell with a scream. <laughs> Shot through the guts. And now, in Spoon River, <laughs> there's a flag over me. <laughs> a flag. <laughs> a flag. I was the first fruits of the battle of Missionary Ridge. When I felt the bullet enter my heart, I wished I'd stayed home and gone to jail for stealing the hogs of Curl Trenary instead of running away and joining the army. Rather a thousand times the county jail than to lie under this marble figure with wings and this granite pedestal bearing the words pro patria. What do they mean, anyway? I wrote him a letter for old time's sake, asking him to discharge my sick boy from the army. Maybe he couldn't read it. So I went to town and I had James Garber, who wrote beautifully, write him a letter. But maybe, maybe that was lost in the mails. So I traveled all the way to Washington. I was more than an hour found in the White House. And when I found it, they turned me away, hiding their smiles. And then I thought, oh well, he ain't the same as when I boarded him. And he and my husband worked together. And all of us called him Abe, mm, there in Menard. As a last attempt, I turned to a guard and said, please, Say it's old Aunt Hannah Armstrong from Illinois. Come to see him about her sick boy in the army. Well, just in a moment, they let me in. And when he saw me, he broke in a laugh and dropped his business as president and wrote in his own hand, Doug's discharge. Talking all the while of the early days and telling stories. Out of me, unworthy and unknown, 
the vibrations of deathless music, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Out of me, the forgiveness of millions, toward millions, and the beneficent face of a nation, shining with justice and truth. I am Anne Rutledge, who sleeps beneath these weeds, beloved in life to Abraham Lincoln, wedded not through union, but through separation. Bloom forever, O oh Republic, from the dust of my bosom. There, by the window, in the old house perched on the bluff, overlooking miles of valley, my days of labor closed, sitting out life's decline. Day by day did I look in my memory as one who gazes in an enchantress's crystal globe and I saw the figures of the past as if in a pageant glassed by a shining dream move through the incredible sphere of time. And I saw a man arise from the soil like a fabled giant and throw himself over a deathless destiny, master of great armies, head of the republic, bringing together in a dithyram of recreated song the epic hopes of the people. At the same time, Vulcan of sovereign fires where imperishable shields and swords were beaten out from spirits tempered in heaven. Look in the crystal. See how he hastens on to the place where his path comes up to the path of a child of Plutarch and Shakespeare. Oh, Lincoln, actor indeed playing well your part. And Booth, who strode in a mimic play within the play, Often and often I saw you as the coin crows winged their way to the wood over my housetop at solemn sunsets. There by my window, alone. Both for the country and for the man and for a country, as well as a man. Tis better to be feared than loved. And if this country would rather part with the friendship of every nation than surrender its wealth, I say of a man, tis worse to lose money than friends. And I rend the curtain that hides the soul of an ancient aspiration. When people clamor for freedom, they really seek for power over the strong. I, Anthony Finley, rising to greatness from a humble water carrier until I could say to thousands, come, and say to thousands, Go. Affirm that this country can never be strong or achieve the good when the strong and wise have not the rod to use on the dull and weak. It was only a little house of two rooms, almost like a child's playhouse. And I had, with scarce five acres of ground around it, and I had so many children to feed and clothe and school, and a wife who was sick from bearing children. One day, Attorney Whitney came along and proved to me that Anthony Findlay who owned 3,000 acres of land, had bought the 80 that adjoined me in 1871 
at a sale for taxes for $11 while my father lay in his mortal illness. So the quarrel arose and I went to law. But when we came to the proof, a survey of the land showed plain as day that Findlay's tax deed covered my ground and my little house of two rooms. It served me right for stirring him up. I lost my case and I lost my place. I left the courtroom and went to work as Anthony Findlay's tenant. I sat on the bank above Bernadotte, dropping crumbs into the water, just to see the minnows bump each other until the strongest got the prize. Or I went to my little pasture, where the peaceful swine sleep in the wallow, or nose each other lovingly, and I emptied a basket of yellow corn. I watched them push and squeal and bite and trample each other to get the corn. I saw how Anthony Findlay's farm of more than 3,000 acres swallowed the little patch of Felix Schmidt's as a bass would swallow a minnow. And I say, if there's anything in man, spirit or conscience or breath of God that makes him different from hogs and fishes, I'd like to see it work. In the village I seemed, no doubt, to go this way and that way aimlessly. But here, by the river, the soft-winged bats fly zigzag here and there. They must fly so, to get to their food. And if you ever lost your way at night in the deep wood near Miller's Ford and dodged this way, now that, Wherever the light of the Milky Way shone through, trying to find the path, you should understand. I sought the way with earnest zeal, and all my wanderings were wanderings in the quest. If the excursion train to Peoria had just been wrecked, I might have escaped with my life. Certainly I should have escaped this place. But as it was burned as well, they mistook me for John Allen, who was sent to the Hebrew Cemetery at Chicago, and John for me. So I lie here. It was bad enough to run a clothing store in this town. But to be buried here? Ay. When my mustache curled and my hair was black and I wore tight trousers and a diamond stud. I was an excellent knave of hearts and took many a trick. When the gray hairs began to appear, lo, new generation of girls laughed at me, not fearing me, and I had no more exciting adventures, wherein I was all but shot for a heartless devil. But only drabby affairs warmed over affairs of other days and other men. And time went on and I lived at Mayor's Restaurant partaking of short orders, a gray, untidy, toothless, discarded rural Don Juan. 
there is a mighty shade here who sings of one named Beatrice. And I see now that the force that made him great drove me to the dregs of life. I was mad. But more than that, I was angry. I was angry at the crooked police, and I was angry at the crooked game of life. So I wrote to the chief of police in Peoria. I said to him, I am at my childhood home here in Spoon River, languishing away. But come and get me. I killed the son of the merchant prince down at Madame Luz. <laughs> And all the papers that said it was an accident at his home while he was cleaning his hunting gun. <laughs> they lied like the devil to hush up scandal and all for the price of advertising. <laughs> I shot him in my room at Madame Luz. And all on account of he pushed me down when I told him despite all the money he had in the world, I was still going to see my lover that night. not beloved of the villagers, but all because I spoke my mind, met those who transgressed against me with plain remonstrance, neither hiding, nor nurturing, nor secret griefs, nor grudges. The act of that Spartan boy is greatly praised. He hid a wolf under his cloak, letting it devour him uncomplainingly. It is braver, I think, to snatch that wolf forth and fight him openly, even in the streets, amid dust and howls of pain. The tongue may be an unruly member, but silence poisons the soul. Berate me who will. I am content. I would have been as great as George Eliot, but for an untoward fate. For look at the photograph of me made by Pennewit, chin resting on hand, deep set eyes, gray too, and far searching. But there was the old, old problem. Shall it be celibacy, matrimony, or unchastity? And then John Slack, the rich druggist, wooed me, luring me with the promise of leisure for my novel. And I married him giving birth to eight children and had no time to write. It was all over for me anyway when I ran that needle through my hand while washing the baby's things and died of lockjaw, an ironical death. <laughs> Hear me, ambitious souls. Sex is the curse of life. <laughs> I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy, happy, and strong. 
and the first place where I worked was at Thomas Green's. On a summer's day, when she was away, he stole in the kitchen, took me right in his arms and kissed me on my body, turning my head on that night and never seemed to know what happened. And, oh, I cried, for what, what would become of me? Oh, I cried and cried. As my secret began to show, Then one day, Mrs. Green said she understood that she would make no trouble for me. Being childless would adopt it. And so, she hid in the house, sent out rumors as if it were going to happen to her, and all went well. The child was born. They were so kind to me. Later, I, I married Gus Wertmann. Years passed, but at political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, oh, that was not it. No, I, I wanted to say, that's my son. That's my son. Almost the shell of a woman after the surgeon's knife. And almost a year to creep back into strength. Till the dawn of our wedding decennial found me my seeming self again. We walked the forest together by a path of soundless moss and turf. But I could not look in your eyes, and you could not look in my eyes, for such sorrow was ours. The beginning of gray in your hair. And I but a shell of myself. And what do we talk of? Sky and water? Anything most to hide our thoughts. And then your gift of wild roses set on the table to grace our dinner. Poor heart. How bravely you struggled to imagine and live a remembered rapture. Then my spirit drooped as the night came on. And you left me alone in my room for a while as you did when I was a bride. Poor heart. And I looked in the mirror, and something said, one should be all dead when one is half dead. Nor ever mock life, nor ever cheat love. And I did it looking there in the mirror. Dear, have you ever understood Ye young debaters over the doctrine of the soul's immortality. I who lie here was the village atheist, talkative, contentious, versed in the arguments of the infidels. But through a long sickness, coughing myself to death, I read the Upanishads and the poetry of Jesus, and they lighted a torch of hope and intuition and desire, which the shadow leading me swiftly through the caverns of darkness could not extinguish. Listen to me, ye who live in the senses and think through the senses only. Immortality is not a gift. Immortality is an achievement. And only those who strive mightily shall possess it. Tell me, 
passers-by. Have any of you had an old tooth that was an unceasing ache? <laughs> uh, perhaps a, a pain in your side that never quite went away. Or a malignant growth that grew with time till even in your profound slumber there was the phantom thought, the shadowy consciousness of the tooth beside growth. <laughs> even so, even so, Thwarted love, defeated ambition, some blunder in life which mixed up your life hopelessly to the end, shall, as tooth, side, float through the dreams of your final sleep till perfect release from this earth sphere shall come to you. And you shall wake as one refreshed and glad <laughs> in the morning. Here lies the body of Lois Spears, born Lois Fluke. Daughter of Willard Fluke, wife of Cyrus Spears, mother of Myrtle and Virgil Spears, children with clear eyes and sound limbs. I was born blind. I was the happiest of women, as wife, mother, and housekeeper, caring for my loved ones and making my home a place of order and bounteous hospitality, for I went about the rooms and about the gardens with an instinct as sure as sight, as though I had eyes in my fingertips. Glory to God in the highest. I went to the dances in Chandlerville and played snap out in Winchester. One time we changed partners, driving home in the moonlight of middle June, and then I found Davis. <laughs> We were married and we lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom I lost ere I reached the age of 60. But I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and on holiday rambled over the fields where I sang the larks, and by Spoon River, gathered many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weed, shouting to the wooded hills and singing to the green valleys. At 96, I had lived enough, that is all, and passed to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. It was four o'clock in late October. I sat alone in the country schoolhouse, back from the road, mid stricken fields. And an eddy of wind blew leaves against the pane and crooned in the flue of the cannon stove with its open door blurring the shadows with the spectral light of a dying fire. In an idle mood, I was running the planchette when all at once my wrist grew limp and my hand moved rapidly across the board until the name of Charles Guiteau was spelled, who threatened to materialize before me. 
I rose and fled from the room, bareheaded into the dusk, afraid of my gift. And after that, the spirits swarmed. Chaucer, Caesar, Poe and Marlowe, Cleopatra and Mrs. Surratt, wherever I went with messages. Mere trifling twaddle, Spoon River agreed. You talk nonsense to children, don't you? And suppose I see what you never saw and never heard of have no words for. I must talk nonsense when you ask me what it is I see. At first, you will know not what they mean, and you may never know, and we may never tell you these sudden flashes in your soul like lambent lightning on snowy clouds at midnight when the moon is full. They come in solitude, or perhaps you sit with your friend, and all at once a silence falls on speech, and his eyes, without a flicker, glow at you. You two have seen the secret together. He sees it in you, and you in him. And there you sit, thrilling, lest the mystery stand before you and strike you dead with a splendor like the sun's. Be brave, all souls who have such visions, as your body's alive as mine is dead. You're catching a little whiff of the ether reserved for God himself. I was Willie Metcalf. They used to call me Dr. Myers because they said I looked like him and that he was my father, according to Jack McGuire. I lived in the livery stable, sleeping side by side with Roger Bowman's bulldog or, or sometimes in a stall. I, I could crawl between the legs of the wildest horses without getting kicked. It's like we knew each other. On spring days, I tramped through the fields to get the feeling that I sometimes lost, that I was not a separate thing from the earth. I would sometimes lose myself as if in sleep, lying with eyes half open in the woods. Sometimes I would talk to animals, even, even toads and snakes, anything that had an eye to look into. Once, I saw a stone in the sunshine trying to turn into jelly. In April days, in this cemetery, the dead gathered all about me and grew still, like a congregation in silent prayer. I never knew whether I was a part of the earth with flowers growing in me or whether I walked. Now, now I know. Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all sob. Oh, 
this idea?